This is the STEM OPT workshop. This is a workshop for students who are currently on OPT and will be extending their OPT. If you are a currently enrolled student, this is not a workshop for you. You will first be applying for OPT. Again, this is the STEM OPT workshop. This is for students who are currently on OPT that need to understand how to extend that work authorization. Moving right along. In terms of what we're gonna spend our time on today, I'm gonna to give you kind of an introduction to what STEM OPT is. I'm gonna talk about how we handle STEM OPT at Santa Clara. I'm gonna spend some time talking about the I-983 training plan, which is one of the really important components of the STEM OPT extension application process. So STEM OPT. STEM OPT, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. It's a really common acronym that we use in higher education. And OPT, of course, stands for Optional Practical Training. STEM OPT extension is an extended work benefit for students that have completed these STEM degrees and who are currently engaged in OPT. Just like OPT, STEM is a continuation of your F1 student status. So it is not a work visa. It does not belong to your employer. It belongs to you, the student. It's part of your F1 status. It's an F1 benefit. And what it is, is a 24-month additional OPT EAD card. So it's a, an EAD card that's valid for an extra two years. It does require that you have completed a specific type of degree in STEM related fields that's on a list that the government maintains. And it also does require some engagement with your employer. So while you don't need an employer lined up to apply for OPT, you do have to be employed with a company that's enrolled in a government program called E-Verify in order to file for STEM OPT. And I'll talk a little bit about kind of what the process looks like in the coming slides. You might recognize this slide from our OPT workshop. This kind of talks a little bit about the timeline for STEM OPT. Everything is really based on that OPT card expiration date. And so what's really important for you to know is that you must have your STEM OPT extension application delivered to USCIS before your OPT EAD card expires. And we recommend filing as soon as possible. We recommend that you file 90 days before your OPT EAD card expires, which is literally the earliest that you can file your application. And the reason is that these applications take such a long time to be approved. Right now, the government is taking at least four to five months to approve these applications, in some cases, six months. The good news is while the application is pending, you are allowed to keep working. So I don't anticipate that you would have a gap in your employment authorization if you file early, right? But if you file late, if you file close to the expiration date of your EAD card, the later you file, the, the more there is a possibility of that work authorization ending before your extension gets approved. And then you have to kind of sit around and wait for the extension to be approved, right? You wouldn't have to leave, but you would have to um, stop working if your extension is pending for more than 180 days after your EAD card expires. So it is critically important that you submit your STEM OPT I-20 request and your training plan to our office early right? We recommend that you submit it to us about four months before your card expires. That gives us plenty of time to review it, issue you your I-20, and help you get your STEM OPT extension application on file as soon as possible. So how we process STEM OPT extension applications at Santa Clara is different than how other schools process them. And this has been impacted a little bit due to COVID-19, but our general process is we ask students to attend or watch a STEM OPT workshop. Good job to everyone on this call or people watching this recording at home. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to work with your company to prepare your I-983 training plan if you have questions throughout that process, we are available for consultation. Once your training plan is ready, you will submit 
a STEM OPT extension request form. It's just a one page ISS form, as well as your completed training plan to our office for review. Our office will review it and we will issue you a new I-20, which has a STEM OPT recommendation on it. We can typically allow you to pick it up in our office or mail it to you right now during COVID-19. Of course, we are just mailing them. We are not physically in the office. We're working from our homes. And then we are also available to review your application before you mail it to the government. So once your I-20 is issued, if you want us to review your application before you mail it to the government, we usually would ask you to come in during drop-in we don't have drop-in advising hours physically in, in our office, but we are still available to review your application remotely. And then once you have your I-20 and you've had your application reviewed, if that's what you choose to do, we ask you to please mail your STEM OPT application to the government. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these processes in the coming slides. So, we're going to talk right now in depth about kind of the most intense aspect of STEM OPT, and that is the Form I-983, which is also referred to as the training plan. So this is a document unlike anything that you've probably ever seen in immigration. It is not, you know, it's not similar to any forms that you filled out before. And much like other government forms, it is quite confusing and has a lot of contradictory information. So we have a couple of resources available that I'll point out to you, and we're definitely here to answer questions. So in order for us to issue your STEM OPT I-20, we have to have a completed and signed and acceptable training plan. If we don't have a training plan, we are not able to issue a STEM OPT I-20. The training plan requires information from you, as well as information and signatures from your employer. It is not possible for you to fill out this training plan by yourself. You do need your employer's participation. And like I said, the form is quite confusing and has a lot of contradictory information. So please do feel free to reach out to us and use our website for assistance. And then we always like to mention the training plan is never submitted to the government. You just submit it to our office and then we keep it in your file. It can be requested um, or our files can be audited or your company's files can be audited, but you will never submit it to the government. Like it's not a part of your STEM OBT application. So, the first thing I want to do before I start talking about a couple of the kind of common questions or mistakes is I want to direct your attention to our STEM OPT website. And so if you go to scu.edu slash STEM OPT, you can see extensive information related to STEM OPT. So let's go to this box that says I-983 training plan. And on this section, we have a link to the government's fillable I-983 training plan, as well as detailed information about how to fill out literally every single question on the training plan. So every single question on the training plan, we have detailed instructions on how to fill it out correctly. We also have examples of common errors that we notice or common questions that students come up with. So I would definitely recommend that when you're filling out the training plan, that you work directly with this website. So again, scu.edu slash STEM OPT, and then select the I-983 training plan box. And this website is navigable. So you can, if you have questions about like specific sections, like let's say we wanna look at measures and assessments, you can kind of navigate throughout the form. And this is updated regularly as questions come up from students. Like, for example, we just added this section about electronic signatures because, of course, COVID-19 means that people are no longer getting 
what we would call like wet signatures or like signatures that are signed with a pen. Oftentimes we're getting like electronic versions of the signatures. So I really wanna call your attention to this page and make sure that you're aware that the information is there. And then I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes just on each section of the form, just talking about common kind of mistakes or errors that we see. So. The most common error mistake that we see on page one of the training plan is people trying to put too much information in the designated school official section. So we have the exact wording that we want. Susan Peters retired, so this image is a little bit old. I think right now it has my name. And so if you try to include additional information, or if you don't include all the information here, for example, if you did not include our address, we would not be able to accept this. We would require that you redo it. And because the field is very small, it's really important that you write only exactly what we have on our website. The student certification is pretty common. The, the biggest question that we get on this section is about electronic signatures. And like I mentioned, we are accepting electronic signatures. We will not accept typed signatures, but any type of a scanned or DocuSign or VeriSign signature will be accepted. So the employer information session is it, section is what we most commonly have issues with. It's really, really important that you work with your company to fill this out correctly. So the two most common errors that we see are under the start date of employment many people will write their OPT start date or the day that they first started working with the company. The start date of employment should be the day that you will, in the future, begin your STEM OPT employment with the company. Now, the way that we explain this is this, you're filling out a training plan for the future, not for the past. And so, what this question, start date of employment, is really asking, it seems like it's pretty obvious, right? What day did you start employment with the company? But that's not what they're asking. They're asking, what day will you start your STEM OPT employment? So it's typically going to be the day after your OPT expires, unless you're starting a brand new job and there's going to be a gap in employment. But usually it's going to be the day after your OPT expires or your STEM OPT start date. So that's a really common error. We see that one all the time. And then the other thing we see is students will write the salary and possibly even the frequency, for example, $100,000 per year, but they won't include any other compensation. They won't list that they receive health insurance. They won't list that they receive deferred stock compensation. What we recommend is instead of listing out every single benefit that you receive, right, dog walking and free lunch every Tuesday and donuts on Thursdays and all kinds of the benefits that we get when we work at companies, instead of saying that, we would recommend that you include just a basic sentence, like, for example, you could write standard corporate benefits, which just implies you are getting the same benefits that every other employee is getting. You're not getting anything extra and you're not excluded from anything because of your immigration status. So these are the two common mistakes that we see. The rest of this information, for example, the employer ID number or the FEIN, the federal employer ID number, that is something that you will have to get directly from your company. There's no way that you would know that off the top of your head. You can technically look it up on your tax documents, but really you do need your company to participate. And the other reason why you need your company to fill out this section is the next section, section four. So section four really spends time outlining all of the things that your company or your employer is obligated to do when they employ you on STEM OPT. For example, if you look at number four, number B, the student will receive on-site supervision and training consistent with this plan by an experienced and knowledgeable staff. 
right? So the company is attesting that they're going to be providing you on-site supervision and training by experienced and knowledgeable staff. And this company representative, it can be your supervisor, it can be an HR person, it could be an immigration official at your company. Some companies have like the CEO sign this section. Whoever your company designates will be signing this and agreeing to these attestations. Section five is usually straightforward. The only time it's not straightforward is if you are working somewhere other than your company's location. And this is uh, your regular work location, not your work location during COVID. So it's accepted that a lot of people, pretty much everyone is working from home during COVID. So that should not impact how you fill out your training plan. You are allowed to work from home because of COVID and because of the shelter in place requirements or health and safety. What can get confusing is if you work for a staffing agency, a con consulting company, or an end client placing company, for example, if you work for ABC Staffing and ABC Staffing has you placed at Google, so you physically go to Google's offices every day, what you want to do here is the employer name, including the employer information on, the, on page two, is ABC Staffing, right? That is who is your employer. ABC Staffing is your employer. They're the ones agreeing to all these rules. They're the ones that will provide you pay, supervision, training. But the site address needs to be that Google address where you physically work on a day-to-day -day basis because you're not working at ABC Staffing, you're working at Google. And so this can get a little bit confusing. If you're in a situation where you're not quite sure, go ahead and reach out to us. And then in this situation where you work for ABC Staffing at Google, it is really important that the official information is an ABC Staffing employee, not a Google employee. So your end client placement, the place where you're doing staffing, they do not sign or complete the training plan in any way. Only your legal employer can do that. All right, so we're going to stop here just for a second. And I want to make a note that the remaining sections of the training plan are narrative sections or essay sections, right? These are not one word answers. It's not like, a, you know, a sequence of numbers. They're asking you and your employer to work together to complete an, a document that outlines what are you going to be doing for the next two years and how does it relate to your major or your program of studies. Before you start writing this narrative or essay section, we want you to do a couple of things. First and foremost, I want to remind you that you are, in the eyes of the government, an F1 international student. You are still studying what you're doing on OPT and STEM OPT extension is practical training related to your major. You're not working, you're training, you're learning, you're engaging in a practical application of your knowledge that you learned in your degree program. And it is so important that you remember this because if you think of yourself as a worker and not a student, all of your answers to these narrative essay section questions will be worker answers and not student answers. They won't be about your training, they'll be about your duties. And so we really want you to focus less on your employment and more on what are you learning how are you expanding your knowledge? How are you applying your knowledge? How is this company helping you gain practical experience related to your major? It's really important to understand it in this way and that will really help you write a good training plan. In addition, I reiterate, this is a future looking document. We're not thinking about what you did while you worked for this company on OPT, 
or on STEM OPT, we are asking what will you be doing for the next two years, for the next 24 months, right? What will you do in the future? And so that is really important as well. As I mentioned, we have extensive documentation on our website that explains how to write a good training plan. But I will give a brief example and maybe make a couple of comments for each of these narrative sections. So the first section is student role. And I wanna point out to you what this slide looks like in the next few slides. So the first thing that you're gonna see on this slide is this picture. And this picture comes directly, it's kind of copied and pasted from the training plan. So the training plan says student role. Describe the student's role with the employer and how that role is directly related to enhancing the student's knowledge obtained through his or her qualifying degree, right? That's what the training plan says. Well, if you look at the actual instruction form for the training plan, which is on the government website, the instructions have a different set of questions. They say, describe what tasks and assignments the student will carry out during the training and how these relate to the student's STEM degree. The plan must cover a specific span of time and detail specific goals and objectives. Well, those are two different sets of questions, right? One is saying, what's the student's role and how is the role related to enhancing the education? And the other one is saying, what are the tasks and assignments? And how do they cover a span of time and how do they relate to goals and objectives? So this is quite confusing. So instead, we're gonna ask you a couple of very specific questions to consider. What are your job duties, responsibilities, and tasks? How are these gonna change over the next two years? How are they connected to the goals and objectives related to your major? How do your day-to-day -day tasks expand and enhance the knowledge that you gained in your program, right? So we're trying to summarize the government's questions, both on the training plan and on their instruction form to try to help you address this section more efficiently. And so we do that in each narrative section, goals and objectives, employer oversight, measures and assessments. And this is all available on our website. And then I'm just gonna go through and I you know, would say the student role is not usually a section where we see a lot of issues. Most students are able to define what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and how it relates to their major. Goals and objectives. I think this is a great opportunity for you to talk to, you know, your supervisor or your company about what it is that you're hoping to learn over the next two years and how that relates again back to your major. So this is not a section we usually see issues with. Employer oversight. I think the examples of employer oversight are basically like, how are you supervised? So the example that I would give of my own job for employer oversight would be that I have a weekly one-on-one -on -one with my supervisor. I have a weekly one-on-one -on -one with my team members. I have a quarterly meeting with my larger group within the university. The university has biannual or twice a year university-wide meetings where we talk about, you know, the goals and the state of the university. And that's how I get feedback. I get feedback from my manager in my one-on-one -on -one meeting, from the team that I'm a member of in my weekly team meetings, and then, you know, and so on. So basically it's just like, how are you getting feedback and supervision? And then measures and assessments, this usually has to do with like the actual company policy. So most likely your company has a policy about how often you get evaluated. Do you get evaluated once a year? Do you get evaluated twice a year? Do you have a 360 degree review? Do you just get reviewed by your direct manager? Do you, you know, receive off cycle promotions and raises, that information would be included here. 
The additional remarks section, really there's nothing that needs to be added there. It's very optional. Sometimes employers will list information about professional development. Occasionally employers will say, we really enjoy working with the student. The student has been such a great contributor to our team. So sometimes we see nice little things like that, but most often it's left blank. And then section six is another employer certification. This can be the same person that signed in section four, but it does not have to be. So some companies will have the manager sign section six, but the human resources professional sign section four, that's fine. It can be the same person. It can be a different person, whatever works for your company policy. The 12 and 24 month evaluations that you see at the end of the training plan are for the future. So they should not be filled out now. They need to be blank right now because they're not due until the one year point of your STEM OPT or the very end of your STEM OPT, right? So these are really only due at specific intervals or if you change employers and you leave a company, but they're not due right now. So please leave these blank when you're just starting the training plan and you're gonna file your application. So at Santa Clara, once you've completed your training plan, we have very specific instructions on how to get your STEM OPT extension I-20. You are never required to meet with an advisor. If you have it taken care of, if your company is gonna file your extension for you, you do not need to meet with us. You are not required to meet with us, but we are here if you want to meet with us. You will email your STEM OBT I-20 request to the ISS inbox. You must use the specific subject line STEM OBT request with your student ID number. Please do not use any other subject line. This helps us sort emails quickly when we're reviewing 100 emails a day. And then in that email, you are required to attach three documents, your training plan, the STEM OPT extension I-20 request, which is an, a one page ISS form. It's very simple to fill out and a copy of your current OPT EAD card. Once you submit your documents to our office, it will take us 10 business days to review them. Business days are Monday through Friday, not including university holidays and not including Saturday or Sunday. 10 business days is about two weeks. So in a great time when we're only getting one or two training plans a week, we usually can do this faster, but there are multiple times a year where we're getting 10, 15, 20 training plans a week. And it just takes us 10 days to even look at it because we have so many other training plans to review. So please do be patient with that processing period. Once we review your training plan, if everything looks good, we'll issue your I-20 as soon as possible. And if there are changes that are needed, we will email you and ask you to make the changes. If you follow our instructions, we will not need to make changes. But if you just do whatever you want and don't follow the instructions on the website, you most likely will need to make changes, which again, adds additional time and delays our issuance of your I-20 because we have to have that final training plan that's signed and completed before we can create your I-20. And then you get to decide typically if we're not in you know, a pandemic to pick up or mail your I-20. Right now we're mailing all documents. We can review your application during drop-in advising, which right now is happening via Zoom, but typically happens in person. And then once we issue your I-20, your application needs to be mailed to the government pretty quickly. So you want to make sure that while we're reviewing your training plan, maybe you're working on your I-765 form and your application. The actual OPT application package, so what you mail to the government, not the training plan, is actually pretty similar to what you filed with OPT. It's not exactly the same. The forms get changed, you know, on a regular basis. The check amounts sometimes go up, but we do have templates and common questions on our website. 
Same as your last application, cover letter, check, passport photos, they need to be new passport photos. And I-765, which that form changes on an annual basis. So really do not use your old I-765. Make sure you fill out a new one from scratch. You'll get your new I-20 from our office. And then you'll include copies of, you know, kind of the same information as your OPT application. The only thing that's really different is for STEM OPT, you also need to include a copy of your diploma and your transcripts. And then same as OPT, clear copies, single-sided, don't staple or paper clip anything, use American standard eight and a half by 11 paper. After your application has been mailed to USCIS, it's gonna take a couple weeks for you to get a receipt notice. If you have questions, if you notice typos, if you're not sure what to do at any point, please just reach out to us directly. We do not ever recommend that you contact the government directly without our guidance. You're allowed to stay in the US while the STEM extension is pending. You're allowed to keep working while the STEM extension is pending, even after your OPT EAD card expires. And the applications take anywhere from three to six months, depending upon the time of year. This time of year, they're usually a little closer to that, you know, three or four months. During the summer, they definitely get up there to five or six months. And then you are obligated to continue to interact with our office. Once your application is approved, like I said, it takes three to six months. You'll get the card in the mail. You are, you know, subject to unemployment limits, as I mentioned, 60 days plus whatever is remaining from OPT. You are going to interact with our office every six months. So you have to report to our office at the 6, 12, 18, and 24 month periods, as well as any time that you change your, any anytime there's like material changes or like major changes to your training plan, and anytime you change employers, you are allowed to travel. The travel signatures on page two of your I-20 are only valid for six months, so you may need a new signature. And we have like a whole list of travel documents on our travel website that you can check out. And then we always just want to remind you that, you know, we are here to help you while you're on STEM OPT, while you're on OPT. You are still a student and, you know, we're here to assist you and answer your questions and help you navigate the government system. So please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And we do usually offer a workshop at least once a year to talk about the H-1B process or work visa sponsorship. So be on the lookout for those invitations. And then if you still have questions after this, which I mean, this was very quick. It was like maybe, you know, 30, 40 minute presentation. I, again, highly, highly, highly recommend that you look at our website. We have so much information on our website and hopefully it's useful to you and answers all of the common questions that we get. It's really important that you understand that STEM OBT advising is done by appointment because not all of our advisors are trained on STEM OPT. So we only have two advisors trained on STEM OPT, whereas there are six people on our team. I would say email is always the best way to get a question answered. Honestly, I think unless your situation is like quite complex, you know, email, we usually respond within, you know, two business days, sometimes much faster.